There's a dance that's in your chair You've given us the bed Now we're stirring up the heads Bring the rain Karen are going to share a little bit of heart but we're going to stay up as well and ask them some questions <laughs> and just get to know them a little bit as a couple but also like Ryan and Karen have been involved in the prayer, like, prayer house movement for over a decade long time and um, have a real heart for this area and also been really um, instrumental in just when they've come over really investing in, in our program and in us as leaders so we're just going to spend some time to share with them I think we might need to move the sofas because they're kind of blocked by the keyboard everything <laughs> sorry it's so smooth <laughs> leaders we went away in January I think if you came to the engine house family um, meeting that was in the town just recently you'll have known that we shared that we felt while we were away um, we really spent time waiting on God and just praying and worshipping over each decision we had to make and we had a few people sort of um, send in prophetic words so Katie was one Liz was another and just at timely moments as we were seeking God and waiting on him these tiny scriptures and words were coming. And so we really clearly heard God um, say that, that our vision in this season is to be a church with a primary mandate to build a house of prayer. So that slightly changes how we um, originally originally um, saw the prayer room. Like in the early days, you may have heard us saying things like, um, the prayer is for the county, it's not just for the church. And it is still for the county, it is still for the nations, it's still wider than just our church. But actually, we really felt like the church needs to be more involved in the prayer room, and it's, it's our prayer room. Like, we're all part of the prayer room, so. <laughs> so let's just, I'm just gonna pray before we kick off. And I just really felt this morning, I was really praying about this, and I felt God saying, like, just to remind everyone that like, he really wants to speak, just like if someone stood up and preached in the word, like there is gonna be scripture in some of what's shared, and he really wants to speak to us today, so um, I really hope that and um, people don't disengage and just sort of, sort of think, you know, this is just some people's opinions on things. Actually, there's some real gold in what these guys have to share. So let's just pray real quickly. Holy Spirit. God, I just thank you that you're already here. Thank you for your, your thick presence in this room already. Thank you for that time of worship, Lord God. Thank you for time in your presence. And right now, Holy Spirit, through of wisdom and revelation, we ask you to come and illuminate our hearts, enlighten the eyes of our understanding, Lord, may we hear directly from heaven. I pray today that in some ways you bypass our minds, Lord, that you would speak spirit to spirit today, Lord God. And it might be that you want each person in this room to hear something different from what's shared. I pray that each person will get some kind of gold and some kind of um, wisdom and some kind of um, even speaking into our individual lives and situations today. So God, we just open up our spiritual ears to hear your word and your word shared. And just thank you for family, Lord. Thank you that these guys are they're our family. They live on the other side of the world, but they're part of, of the kingdom of God. They're part of our wider family. So we just thank you for them. And we just thank you for them. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so just because I don't want to forget at the end, I just want to let you know that Brian and Karen have made a CD. And it's brilliant. They, they did one of their songs over communion today. But they're out in the cafe. And they're, is it £10? It's one of my go-to albums, and that's not even me, that's, that'd be real. It's good, it's so good. It's really good, so good. if you want to get an album. It's a great album. And oh, also, <laughs> <laughs> John, John's blowing his own trumpet here. I'm, I'm joking, I'm just joking. Um, John designed the artwork, didn't you, John, for the cover, so um, um, it's really good. So go check it out. <laughs> okay, so we thought it'd be really good just to like get to know you guys a little bit first. So can you just share like, where you're from, um, both of you, and it'd also be good to hear your story, like how did you meet, like, it's great to hear people, like, how did you meet the story? Over to you. Uh, um, hi. Uh, hi. 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 How's everyone? I, before we get into this, the presence of God this morning, right, I mean, we just are so grateful to be in the presence of Jesus with all of you. We, we even had some time last night um, with some of the, what was it? <laughs> I don't know what day it is. Um, but just the presence of God, we're instantly family, right? Like we belong to him, and then because we belong to him, we belong to each other. 
And so it's just so grateful. I'm just so grateful to be in the presence of God with all of you, and it just feels like home. So thank you for allowing us to share. Um, do you want to tell? I don't know how much of our story you tell. Okay, we won't tell that. We'll get into the nitty gritty. Um, well, so I, can I, I'll just, yeah, you could. Hi. <laughs> uh, so we are both from Southern California, uh, the Los Angeles area. Uh, I lived my whole life in Pasadena and grew up there. And then um, my parents are both in ministry, and my dad is a pastor and led a Bible college, and we actually traveled as a family um, overseas quite a bit to, to the UK and to Europe, um, South America, doing worship conferences. So whenever they could, they took the kids along too. So we got to experience the Lord in other countries, which was like huge for me. Um, and then I just, yeah, lived my whole life growing up in the church, Went to Christian University even, and it like just sort of, at that point in my life, had become a little f too familiar with the Lord, if that makes sense. Like, it just was almost too comfortable and too, like, you know how you can get sometimes maybe desensitized to the Holy Spirit. And then I met this guy, who um, had actually just encountered Jesus, and I was like, had a front row seat to watching someone's life, like, being completely, radically transformed in front of my face. And I was like, wow, this is so awesome to see, see it happening, like, in real time in front of me and changing someone. So um, that's, yeah, a little bit of my backstory. Yes. I did not grow up in the church. Um, <laughs> I grew up in other places. Um, but I, I had a radical experience with the Lord. I, I was part of a performing arts school. I, my parents got saved when I was eight, but they had a kind of a difficult experience with the church. Um, and they, they left the church out of their own wounding, and I was a little kid. I didn't know. You don't know these things when you're a kid, you know? Um, and my parents just kind of developed this Christianity that was like, God is everywhere, so why do we need to go to church? Which kind of sounds nice until you're raising children and we have no structure in our lives of like who God is and how to learn the Bible, you know. So I grew up and by the time I was a teenager, I just kind of was culturally a Christian because my parents listened to Christian music and they bought little Christian porcelain precious moment dolls. And so that was kind of like my version of Christianity. Um, and then in school, met a girl, it wasn't this girl, she's lovely, um, but I met another girl who we won't talk about, but, um, and then that just kind of set me on a trajectory that was very different, and because of the things that I was doing, I was like, obviously I'm not Christian anymore, so I'll just be a good guy, but do all of these things. Um, so I was doing that in school, and then um, was part of a performing arts um, program, and we ended up in France, and so... We, did, we sang choral literature. Sorry, this is lots of backstory, but you'll be okay. Um, we were singing choral literature, went to this cathedral called Chartres, just a little bit outside of Paris, walked into this cathedral, sang the Ave Maria. We're in a Catholic cathedral, singing Ave Maria, and the Holy Spirit hits me in the middle of this um, choir that was not Christian whatsoever, like the opposite of Christian. And I fell out in the middle of all of my friends that I've been partying with for three years, weeping uncontrollably. God is big, God is big, God is big. Um, and then kind of, and that was the year before I met Karen. So that was France, and this is, that's, don't want to let go of my age right now, but that was almost 20, over 20 years ago. Um, <laughs> don't let the age go. So... You know, we, so we have some history of travel and all of those things. And the Lord, like in the last few years, um, we were in Southern California. The Lord moved us to Middle Tennessee near Nashville. Um, and it was, all of that's a crazy story. But while we, when we made that move, all of a sudden we had dear friends of ours who were missionaries to France. All of a sudden France started coming up. We were in Ohio and got a prophetic word about Southern England and Northern France and like Normandy. And we were just like, okay. <laughs> well, we love England already because we have dear friends that are England, so from England. So I told the person who gave us the word, I was like, if I tell my wife we're moving tomorrow, like you shoot, we love England so much. Uh, we love the people um, of England. So the next day we talked to our missionary friends who are in France and we said, we just got this prophetic word about Southern England and Northern France. Um, and specifically Normandy, and they said, well, that's very interesting because we have friends in Normandy 
who just contacted us yesterday saying that they really want to see worship and prayer um, continue to grow in Normandy in the south. And so that was actually um, Anna White's parents. Um, so this is all fresh two years ago. Um, ended up in Normandy and visiting Jared and Chrissy. Ended up meeting John and Anna, Jim and Mary Ware, who some of you guys know, they've come and visited here. Uh, we've had kind of a whirlwind in the last three years of the Lord just kind of zeroing in on southern England and northern France. And I don't believe that that's just something that he's given to us for our family. I think the Lord's highlighted these regions on purpose. I think for what the God's about to do in the earth, he selected your place and northern France, which let's not get into the politics of what's happening right now, but it's a very interesting time for England and France to be doing things together. But this is the kingdom. And so despite whatever cultural climate is happening right now, the Lord has zeroed in on southern England and northern France and said, this is where I'm beginning to start what I'm about to do. And so we, have a, we come with a passion for that, to see that. And we believe one of the ways he's doing this is by establishing, establishing places of worship and prayer. If you, you can go throughout history and see whenever God is about to do something in the earth, he raises up day and night worship. You can see it from the Moravian movement. You can see it from the, the outpouring in Bangor, Ireland. You can see it in so many places throughout history. Every time the Lord is about to do something, he makes a sound in the earth. And it's a sound of his people drawn to his presence day and night. Amen? Amen. Amen. Sorry, I'm not preaching. Off the back of that, maybe you could share a little bit about and the restoration of the tabernacle of David, and we've got some scriptures to put up on the screen. Yeah. Oh, well, I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know if we're getting to know each other. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, but sometimes this topic of house of prayer has a little bit of stigma on it. Like people don't really know what to do with it. Even in the states, sometimes you say house of prayer, and people are like, "Oh, <laughs> I don't know why they do that." But they're like, "Oh, one of those," you know. And I, and I think that there's some interesting things about that. I think some people think that this is a man-made idea. Like, oh, it's this little place in Kansas City that came up with this great idea of day and night worship, and they're trying to work this thing out of this man, Mike Pickle's vision. Um, the truth of the matter is, you can see through history, IHOP KC is not the first house of prayer to exist since Jesus came. And it's actually not the first house of prayer ever. It started in the Tabernacle of David. It's David... This man who didn't even have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of him has a revelation that somehow he can take this Ark of the Covenant that existed behind this huge curtain that no one could go into except for one day a year. He had this revelation like, hey guys, I'm going to pitch a tent <laughs> and then we're going to put the Ark in the middle of the tent and then all day, every day, we're just going to sing songs and pray. In the, and you know what I mean? I can't even imagine what it looked like when he first said this to everyone. They're kind of like, uh, if we go in when it's not the Day of Atonement, like bad things will happen, you know? But there was something that God gave David as a revelation of his presence and the purpose of intimacy. That he was able to, in the middle of, I just, can we get, grasp this concept? We, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. We don't know what it was like to be a believer without the Holy Spirit. Somehow David has a grasp of the concept of the presence of God and the importance of it being in the center of everything they did. And he pitches this tent. And for a majority of his reign, he has day and night worship going over and over again. And then we have this random scripture in Amos 9.11, if we can go back to that. That says, um, and this is Old Testament, folks, right? So we're all okay. Is everyone okay? <laughs> I love the Old Testament. Amos 9.11, it says, On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom, and that all Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who does this thing. First of all, let's see the direct link of the tabernacle of David with the nations coming in. Old Testament, the Jewish people weren't super excited about the Gentiles. If you read inside the scripture, when you see the story of Jesus, every time you see the Jewish people and Jesus starts talking about like the Samaritans and all of this stuff, there's a weird thing. The Jewish people are not too excited about people who aren't Jewish people. 
But we have in Amos 9.11 this thing that says that the tabernacle of David would be raised up and that the Gentiles will get to come in. Isn't that wonderful? Something about day and night worship actually affects missions and actually affects people coming into the kingdom. It's not some weird bless me club where a bunch of people come into a place and just worship Jesus. It's actually key for the nations to come in. Just so you guys know, like, missions has been going on for a really long time, right? Like, we see from, like, Acts 2, or, like, it's been going on since the Holy Spirit was poured out. But they've seen in the last decade more fruit happening in unreached people groups because of the partnership of worship and prayer and the missions movement than they've seen in decades. Like, the actual fruit and of people coming to know the Lord as they've partnered with the prayer movement and prayer, day and night prayer and worship has, I mean, the numbers are staggering. I don't have them, but it's exciting. Look it up. It's exciting. So check this out. So that's Amos 9-11. I'm going to get excited. But um, that's Amos 9-11. So I really believe the fulfillment of the tabernacle of David is in a man and his name's Jesus. Right? He said, I am the temple. Destroy this temple and in three days I'll build it again, right? He said, I am the temple. Paul says, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? So in the New Testament believer, we see the fulfillment of the tabernacle of David. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, believers. In the presence of Jesus, nonstop. We see the fulfillment, right? So it would be very easy for us to be like, see? It's fulfilled. We don't have to do this, right? That would feel really good. But then this happens. Acts 15. 16 through 18, the Holy Spirit's already been pulled, poured out. We've seen tongues of fire. We're seeing miracles happen. We're seeing the church grow in the New Testament. And then we have the scripture in Acts 15 that's quoting Amos 9:11. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent and its ruins. I will rebuild and I will restore it that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things. So what now? Like, that means there still is something for us to do as believers, and there still is a place for the actual physical expression of day and night worship called the church. Right? I, this is my favorite thing to say because my wife is here. I don't always get to say this with my wife near me. <laughs> She's like, what are you going to say? But if I told you, you guys, I love my wife, right? And then you said to me, Ryan, how do you, how do you love your wife? Um, and I would say, well, once a week, I come into a building that's not my home. And I listen to a man, who obviously is not my wife, tell me about my wife. And then I listen to him, and then this is how I love my wife. You would think I was out of control. But then I'd say, no, no, I radically, radically love my wife. I come to a building that's not my house twice a week and I listen to a stranger tell me about my wife and this is how I love my wife. You would say, Ryan, you don't love your wife. But there are believers on the planet today that say, I love Jesus with my whole heart. How do you love Jesus? Well, I come to a building that's not my house and I listen to a stranger who is not Jesus tell me about him. And this is how I love him. See, the issue is not about church and the structure of church. The issue is about, we have an intimacy problem. We say we know someone that we don't know. Because we don't spend time with him. I'm, I'm, we're all in this together, right? Like The reason I love the house of prayer so much is it gives me opportunity to come together with community and to seek him. Because if left to my own devices, we have an Old Testament full of stories that if people are left to their own devices, they will forget him and they will do things that are disobedient to him. It's who we are. He's been so gracious to us that he gives us the Holy Spirit, but then he commands us to live in community. And one of the things that the House of Prayer does that's so beautiful is it gives us opportunity to come in and to be together and to wait on him. And to create this rhythm of coming and meeting with him and worshiping him and ministering to him and receiving from him, right? Acts 2, we see this already in the beginning of the church. We see it. Every day they went to the temple. And this was in their culture, right? They were Jewish people. It was in their culture. But every day they were in the temple, every night they were house to house together. 
Sometimes when I go to churches and I say this, everyone gets super scared that we're going to start like a <laughs> every night home group, right? Like that's just like this, <laughs> what? <laughs> you know? Like, and that's not what this is about, but it is about like every time you see throughout history, when the Lord starts building up this day and night rhythm of worship and prayer, every time it's a prophetic statement to the people of God that Jesus is worthy of our attention. It's as simple as that. If we make it more than that, it gets a little bit crazy. We can start saying it is more than what it is. But the truth of the matter is, is Jesus is worthy. Right? Like everyone's like, what are you, you guys are so fanatical. You're always worshiping Jesus. Okay, well it's either that we're fanatical or that he's worthy. And everyone wants revival, but no one reads the stories when people were on their face for days just being with him. You know those people didn't think about revival when they were doing it. We see all these stories from the end where we're like, oh, this is how we get revival, right? This plus this equals revival. The people that were doing that, they weren't thinking that. When Jesus pours out the Holy Spirit and tongues of fire fall on those folks in the book of Acts, they weren't in the upper room saying, yes, I just see tongues of fire. <laughs> you know, but they just weren't doing the last thing that Jesus told them to do. Wait on me. It really is that simple. And, and all of these other things are, sometimes we can make excuses, right? I'm chief of these. I love Netflix, right? Anyone? No, just me. Um, there's just things where the Lord's like, will you find your recreation in me? When you're tired and weary from the day, will you come to me? Why are you going to these other things? You know they won't fill you. But then if we as the body of Christ don't offer a space for people to come, yes, you can meet with the Lord in your home, of course. But if we don't offer a space for people to come and the Lord says, come and meet with me, and people don't know what to do, they should have a place they can go. Right? Throughout history, the church's doors were open all the time. All the time. Anyway, sorry, that was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I feel hungry to get in a prayer room right now. Let's just, let's just go and worship. So can you tell us, can you both tell us one story of a glory encounter you had with Jesus in a house of prayer that you'll never forget that marked you and changed you forever? Um, for me, it was uh, last year when we came, we have been traveling to southern England and northern France because the Lord said, and so we, we come in the summer, we bring our kids and we go for it. Um, the, but the last two, last year, we were both, we came to the house of prayer here, and then we were at the prayer room um, in Normandy at Bethany, where, where Anna's parents had started like a ministry center there, and where they're planning a church there. So there were two things that happened, and I just felt so moved. As soon as we were in the prayer room here, I felt like I could instantly hear what God was praying for this area. Like, like it was so easy to just sort of walk in and be with everyone, people I've never met before, who've been living and worshiping, serving the Lord in Cornwall, and praying. And it's like you could instantly tap in to what God was praying and the heart of God for that area. So um, that was like, whoa, that's so amazing to me. And then it happened again when we were in France last year. And that was probably like, we were just all praying in this little prayer room. Oh, that was two years ago. The first time we were in France praying in this little prayer room with eight people, we were just worshiping and it sounded like there were, the room was filled with people. And I was just so moved and I, we were kind of just praying and I felt, I was praying in tongues, but I realized I was saying the same thing over and over again. And I was like, I don't know what that means, but I recognized like two words and one of them seemed French and I don't speak French. Uh, we're learning. But um, I spoke with my friend and realized that the two words I was saying over and over again were um, heart and ground. And I felt like I received, like I felt a word from the Lord that, that, um, that the heart of Jesus was in the ground in Europe and just his heart was starting to beat. And it was coming alive and that people who have been serving and missionaries or 
people who've walked with the Lord in that nation had just been seeding the ground with their their tears and their prayers and their worship, and that the heart of the the heart of the Lord in the ground was beginning to beat and come alive. And that just really was like a huge thing for me. But it was tied to when we came here last year too, just being able to walk into a prayer room you've never been in, in a country that's not your home country. And instantly you can just like, I know the, what how God feels about this place and this people. And just be overwhelmed by his love and how he sees them. Like it's the coolest thing ever. Like I just, yeah. Like if you ever want to find out what God's doing in an area, just walk into the prayer room and just start praying. And he's like, this is my heart for this people. And it's always so extravagant and so amazing and so much love and like just bowls you over. So yeah, those are my, my prayers. I love that. Um, isn't that wonderful? I just, when Karen was sharing that, I love that like one of her highlighted experiences was God sharing his heart for other people. How many times do we come into the presence of God for something we need? And there is something about this establishment of a place of his presence that when we're satisfied in him, we can hear from him about things that have nothing to do with that. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think. I have a lot, but I... There's something about... Oh, let's see. I, so I was teaching an internship um, back in Pasadena when we were, in, we were part of the Pasadena International House of Prayer for a season, and we're still a part of them. They're our sending agency as missionaries. Um, and we had these interns, and sometimes... And part of their internship was being in the prayer room, and sometimes we would come in, and as soon as we played a note, like the presence of God was just like crazy. Like just, we were just like, whoa, we're in, and how did this happen, and oh my gosh. And I remember one time going in, and it was like difficult. Like it took, it took a little bit of time, and all of the interns were like, what's wrong? What did we do? You know, like what's happened? Why, is, why did it take so long? And I told them, I was like, isn't it great? And they just looked at me like I was crazy, like, you know, and I said, this is what daily intimacy looks like. We put so much pressure on a once a week setting that we demand of God that he be a certain thing for us in these moments. And if it doesn't happen that way, then we're very dissatisfied. Like, oh, worship wasn't that great this morning. Like, they played my least favorite song or so-and-so did this or... The kids were around me, like anyone have kids, like, you know, like the kids were there and I was distracted. And, but when we put all this pressure on one moment to fulfill that, then it's very easy for us to be dissatisfied when it doesn't do what we expected it to do. And there's something about the daily rhythm. So I told the interns, I was like, it's great that it takes a long time. Let it take a long time. Wait on the Lord. Ooh, I have, so this is my idea. When I first, when I first, discovered the Tabernacle of David. It was soon after I got saved in 1999. And those of you that know about IHOP KC, they're celebrating 20 years this year of day and night worship, 24-7. 20 years, 24-7, live worship and prayer that's been going on since 1999. So when I first learned about the Tabernacle of David, IHOP KC isn't there for, I don't think Google existed in 1999. I couldn't like Google. Anyway, some of you don't know the hardship of not having Google, but some of you do. There was no way to find out about these things. So in 1999, I find out about the Tabernacle of David, and I'm trying to get all of my worship buddies together to do like a 24-hour watch. And I think I got like two friends to do worship leading with me, and it was just pathetic. And we were putting on CDs and just lay, falling asleep in the sanctuary, trying to do 24 hours a day. So flash forward like 15 years, I'm in a church in San Diego, they're going to do a 24-hour watch. They were able to do the whole thing just within their own church, which was just phenomenal, you know. And so we're having this time of worship, and I told them, I'm with you, I'm going to be there the whole 24 hours. Um, and so we're going 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. the next day. Start at 6 p.m. Amazing worship leaders. These guys are fantastic. The presence of God is amazing. 6 a.m. rolls around. This guy gets up and he starts playing these old vineyard tunes. Older gentleman leading worship. He plays his first like old vineyard tune. And as soon as he starts playing, the presence of God just comes in the room. And I'm just bawling. And 
And I was like, 12 hours? And all of a sudden, like, this is happening. I'm like texting Karen, like, I love you. Jesus is amazing, you know? And, uh, and I'm asking the Lord, like, what is going on, you know? 12 hours? And the, the Lord said to me, he said, my people don't wait on me anymore. And now I didn't start, like, making 12-hour services so that we could touch that glorious moment. But the, the Lord was using an extreme example to me about how little we give him time to do what he wants to do. And how much we're in a hurry for him to do what he, want, he, he wants to do. And then when he doesn't do it on our timeline, then we get upset. <laughs> but when we have this daily rhythm in our lives, I can say to my interns, like, you know what? That was fine. That set was beautiful. The Lord showed up in a really wonderful way. Tomorrow it will probably be different. Isn't that wonderful? Could you imagine like being able to say, like what we experienced this morning in worship, and just be like, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Let's do it again. You know? Um, so I think that, that that was one of them, but there's many there's about that. That's, it. That's amazing. That just reminds me of the first time we did 24 hours here. And we just had this moment at 4 a.m. I think, Ross, you came, didn't you, for that 4 a.m. set, that first 24 hours. And there was just such a beautiful sense of God's presence. And literally, you close your eyes and you could see the throne room of God and you could see what was happening. It was amazing. I want to do another 24 hours. Like, so, like, <laughs> hungry for more. So, like, we're nearly out of time. I still have loads of questions. Um, Holy Spirit, what do you want me to ask? What should we say? What else do you want to Yeah, we're going to open it up, but we're almost out of time. So, has anyone actually got a question that they'd like to ask these guys in the room? A really difficult one to really challenge, and Karen's got to answer it. <laughs> That's cool. No one's got a question. That's good. Um, so I kind of put you on the spot. I didn't give you any time to think. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit about where we're at, Matt. Would you like to share a little bit about like our prayer and culture building team and where we're at as a prayer room at the moment? Yeah, sure. Just really briefly. Yeah. Um, so, um, on kind of, we're really, like Ryan and Karen have shared, our heart is kind of, and you've shared at the beginning, didn't you, about our mandate being the house of prayer here at the Engine House, and um, God's really laid this on our heart. Um, on Friday mornings we meet as a team and we just um, we worship together um, and we just seek God together um, and minister to him basically with no real agenda but just to, just to kind of worship him um, and, um, and from these times that's flowing into our Wednesday nights and, and things like that and we really feel that God is doing something here um, in the engine house um, in the prayer room and like kind of has already been shared, we believe it's all of us, we're all involved in this, that this isn't just a couple of people called to pray and worship God, that this is actually what we're all called and made to do. Um, I don't believe that um, our job is our, what we're made to do, so you're not meant to be, you're, you're, who you are isn't a butcher, who you are isn't a carpenter, who you are isn't a businessman, who you are isn't, isn't those things, who you are, you are made to worship, you're made to to love on God, to be with him and be in his presence. And those things are an assignment from God. And we're blessed with those assignments. And he sends us out to do those things, but it all comes from that place of intimacy with him first. And we've said this like quite a lot. And I think something that God showed me this week is we've been talking to you guys oh, and as a family a lot about the house of prayer. And, um, and in many ways, it's not been as accessible for everyone um, because we've been doing 6 a.m.s. Um, and so that's been difficult for some people to get to, um, which is understandable, um, just because of daily rhythms and stuff like that. So our heart really is to see the prayer room more accessible for people so that you guys can get in and we can worship together, see God's face together for our community, for the nations, for our families, for situations that are going on in and around us. Um, and so, um, as you guys know, I really believe that God's called me into this, um, which is why I've stepped down from the youth work. Um, and we believe God's calling more people into this um, to establish the house of prayer 24-7, night and day, because God is worthy. He is worthy. And we believe that out of that, um, our, our, our town, Red Ruth, is going to change. Campbell and Paul is going to change. This county is going to change. This nation is going to change. And the nation is going to change. As I went away, when I went away to IHOP a few weeks ago, it blew my mind how, um, how like, I met a couple of other people and 
there were God's raising up houses of prayer across the nations. And, um, and so we're a part of this international move that God is doing. And it's not, so like when we meet here every morning, when we meet here on a Wednesday night, and when we meet here um, on other days when, that, when the prayer opens up more very soon, we're joining in with the angels. We're joining in with the nations and praising God. And so, um, and so there's a bigger picture. God is like showing me the bigger picture of what this house is involved with in the nations. And, and with the angels in heaven, like with, we're partnering with God in the, in the heaven, on the earth realm, from the heavenly realm. And so like there's, there's so much more to this and it's so rich, but we have to grab hold of it. And we have to, um, we have to kind of, yeah, move with what God is doing. Um, like, it, I know I've, I have to have time. I'll be like two seconds. Um, like, I know like we should, Raymond shared testimony when I preached last, um, about kind of what God did in her life in a moment uh, when we went out to IHOP, where she had an encounter with God and like God dealt with some of the issues and struggles that she's been having from her earthly father in a moment. She could have had counseling. She could have had that stuff and I, I don't doubt that wouldn't have worked in a way, but Raymond just needed one moment with her father to experience God. And, and so this is, the, this is what we believe will happen. Some of the stuff that we're carrying will will be broken off instantly just because we've made space and we've waited on the Lord. Um, and so there's freedom to be had in this. Um, but also, Rayma carried a, kind of like a cynical spirit, and I know she, might, she shared this and won't mind me sharing again, but the stuff of this, like the prayer room culture, like people in tears and like intimacy with God offended her. Like it upset her, like she struggled with this until she had a moment with God when God healed her and restored her heart to how he made her to be. And we've all got issues, we've all carried stuff and we've all got these struggles. But I really feel like for some people here, identifying where the struggle is from is really key. Raymond's struggle wasn't the prayer movement, it wasn't people praying, crying, all that stuff. The struggle was stuff with her earthly father that manifests itself towards intimacy with God. And then we people here, because we all carry stuff, there's no shame or guilt in this, so please hear my heart, but like, who find this offensive, who struggle with like, how much we're going after this, and how much we really believe this, and, and that isn't because we're going after this, and it isn't because this isn't what God is doing, it's perhaps because we're carrying something that God wants to deal with in this time, and so I wanna just bless you who, if that is someone in this place who's going through this, or who's not here today who, who has been going through this, and, and yeah, I just pray that you'd be free and, and kind of ride with this. Raymond rode with it and she went with it. And in that, because she did that, I really felt there was a, there was a restoration God did because she didn't just walk out the meeting and couldn't be bothered with it. She's pressed in and stayed pressed in. And so, um, yeah, that's all I have to say. some of the conversations we've had about, you know, God can use counselling and inner healing and all those tools, but sometimes just a moment in his presence, you know, we're transformed in his presence, and he knows what that stuff is in our heart, but we need to know. John, do you want to really quickly just share something of your heart? Yeah, I think, um, very simply, like, I love the prayer room because I need it, and, like, we were, we were created for a relationship um, with each other and with God, and the prayer room should be the space where you can just go deeper. Like, there's a very much a desire and a hunger to worship him. And then there's also a fragility and a vulnerability about who I am. Oh, I need to be in his presence. I need him. So, um, I think I just wanted to say, like, it's not about comparison and it's not about time. Like, if God's saying 24 hours, great. He'll do it. It's actually just about being in his presence, being with him. And that could be for like someone like Matt, like he's, he's committing days to that in a week. For someone like me, it might be like a morning a week. It could be like an hour a week. It could be 10 minutes. But there's less like, I think we can get sometimes overwhelmed with, with the bigness of it. And I love big vision and big vision is good. But it's also really important to know this is just about your heart. Like, this is about your heart before, before the Lord. Um, yeah. Oh, can I? So when John was saying that, you know, we have the story of Jesus with the widow's mind, 
Like, we look at IHOKC and you have 18 year olds, 19 year olds, <laughs> to like tw mid 20s, giving eight hours a day to the prayer room. And that sounds extravagant and huge, but the truth of the matter is the Lord values when the man who's working 80 hours a week comes in for 45 minutes. It means as much to him as the 18 year old that has all the time in the world to give the Lord. That's how, this is who our God is. Like what John was saying is so right. This isn't about trying to get you guys in the prayer room eight hours a day. This is about you evaluating what you have to give and where you're giving that, right? The widow's might, she had everything she had to give, she gave to him. And it didn't mean that like, ooh, look at this huge gift, right? I mean, 18 year olds to 20 something year olds that have all the time in the world, may you give a season of your life to being in the presence of God that much. May you sacrifice that. You have that time. If you don't know it, you do. <laughs> all of us who work jobs and things like that, we understand what it was like to have all of that time. But to those of us that are moms and dads that have little tiny babies and that can't be at the prayer room for hours a week, when you come in for the 30 minutes that you can, the Lord receives that as he would the young one who just gave 40 hours a week. It means the most to him. And then our job as leadership is to value that the same way and also create space so that you can come, right? Like, so that we know babies nap at these times. Let's not skip, let's make a prayer room slot for that we know moms can make. Let's, let's make a prayer room slot for the businessman who has a lunch break that's an hour and we want to make space for them to come because we believe that that offering they have to give is valuable. So this is the joy of the beginnings of something like this and understanding and valuing people and valuing their sacrifice. We're going to do a bit more worship now. Um, the service officially has finished because it is 10 past 12. But if you want to stay and do post-service worship, we're going to have a song first of all by Ryan and Karen, one of their songs. And then we're just going to continue to worship for a bit longer. So please stay if you want to, but there's no um, pressure. Like it, it is officially finished. So um, thank you, guys. And the prayer is open as, as usual. And our prayer team, we're in the yellow lanyards. If you want some prayer for anything, then please come over. They'll be in this corner or in the prayer room. Karen has a word, so we're just going to share a word quickly. Thanks, Sorry, I just didn't know when that would be the right time to share it, but when we were talking about coming into a community of people who love the Lord and just worshiping together and seeing, I just saw this picture when we were worshiping this morning. Like, it was so, like Ryan said, the presence of God was so amazing. And I saw sometimes when you think about a body of, of believers, like a church, I think of it like people digging a well in their town, like we're digging a well for the presence of the Lord. and. And I just instantly was standing here and I saw this well like right in the center of your church. And But it was sudden, it, I wish you, I could like make a movie of what I saw because it was suddenly like, it wasn't, it was not shallow. It was so deep, but it was like the Holy Spirit it was like a drill, but it was invisible. This invisible drill that just like plummeted into the depths of the earth here. And that it was for a geyser that was going to come shooting up or maybe already shooting up. And it wasn't just a one time. It was like this constant giant fountain that was flowing from so deep. It was like as deep as it was going as was as high as it went into the heavens. And it was just so deep. And I just felt like what God has done and what you guys have done as a church that he's going to take the digging, but then multiply it by the power of the Spirit to go so deep, like deeper than you can ever imagine. And then it would come up so high, like higher than you could ever imagine. And I just saw this water would just be constantly shooting up. And it wasn't, it, I think there's times for peace and for the Lord to minister to us in calm. But this was so powerful. Like, it was like this mighty power of water just shooting up into the sky. And I felt that the, it was so high that the water was seeding all of the clouds in Cornwall. And that it was just going to rain down on everyone in just a powerful way. And I just felt like 
The Lord is so, the verse I actually thought of, which doesn't have anything to do with water, was in Psalm 121 where it talks about the Lord doesn't slumber or sleep. And I just felt like God was saying, I am awake in Cornwall. I'm not sleeping or slumbering. I am watching over what I've put down here and what's happening here. And that there's so much energy. Like he has so much energy just in, his, in the spirit for what he's doing here. And that it will be like this powerful source. Uh, for this region, and it was just coming out of what has been dug here. If would you hold your hands out like this? We're just—I know we're dismissed. This is all bonus church time. <laughs> I just felt when Karen was saying that uh, there there might be people here who've labored long in this place, and who have longed to see the day that water would come up. And I just feel like the Lord wants to encourage everyone in this room that it's coming soon and that your labor has not been in vain that he hasn't been sleeping that he's seen your labor and that he's gonna come through for you we come against every lie of the enemy that would say that god will not come through and we speak the truth today that god is awake in cornwall and this well is not just a still well, but an artesian well that is moving with life and life abundantly. Even as I said that right now, I feel like physical healing is, is in that. There's people who have physical needs that will come to this place and drink from this well and be healed. There's people with emotional and mental needs that are gonna come into this place Drink from the well and be set free. Even today, I believe there's people here right now who have a physical need or a mental need and the Lord is touching that right now as a first fruit of what he's going to do in this community. So Jesus, we thank you that you're not slumbering. We believe and have faith. You have your eye on this place. Your face is turned toward Cornwall, and you have purposes beyond our wildest imagination. What the lady had said earlier during communion, if you can imagine it, if you can picture it, it's, it's bigger than that. It's not even close. If you have a wild dream about what God can do in this community, you haven't even got close to what he's about to do. No eye has seen, no ear has heard what he has for you. So Jesus, we just say thank, thank you. And just in this posture of receiving, I just believe that that's all he's asking you to do is open your hands today. He's not asking you to work harder or dig harder. He's asking you to receive. So we say yes to you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's in your chair You've given us the bed Now we're stirring up the head